up in a word of prayer, and then we'll get through this presentation, and we'll answer questions at the end. So that, that's our plan today. So let me say a few preliminary <coughs> remarks. I'll open this up in prayer, and we'll take questions at the end just so we can ensure that I can get through the presentation. So a couple of remarks is this. Is that this is our presentation. It's like a three to five year strategic plan, basically outlining where we think the Lord is leading us in the next three to five years. And we spent a lot of time discussing, praying, uh, sharing this with the elders and deacons and some of the lay leaders, getting their feedback to some degree and modifying it. So we spent a lot of time on this, and so we just want to present it to the church in the hopes that you guys will understand and be on board and champion where the church, where we're going. A couple of just practical points. I know that from last year, one of the, one of the helpful critiques was actually there's just a lot of information and a lot of words and a lot of talking. So we unfortunately didn't modify that too much. <laughs> I tried my best, but aesthetically, I think it's less words. Um, but I don't expect everyone to remember all this. You know, it's just to give a sense. But just to keep that in point. We make copies for people who aren't able to see the TV screen because it's small, and hopefully you can get a sense of what I'm trying to present here today. With that said, let me pray for us, and then we'll get right into it. Father, we thank you, Lord, for gathering us here, and we pray that you ignite, you would ignite us, both in heart and mind, Lord, to uh, further your kingdom for the sake of your glory and the Great Commission. Lord, we ask that you would put our individual and personal agendas aside and help us to see the agenda of the kingdom. Help us collectively, as a covenant community, to move forward together by your grace, calibrated by the gospel, and we ask that you would do this for the sake and glory of Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Okay, panel presentation, we find your vision. So there is an agenda. There's going to be four points that we'll consider, very similar to last year for those of you who remember. First, we're going to quickly review our vision and mission, not nearly as much in detail as last year. Second, we're going to give an update on how we did with our 2015 goals. This was an, a subjective assessment by the leaders, that is, leaders, elders, and deacons. And then we'll spend the bulk of, the bulk of our time on the third point, which is review three to five year strategy and goals. And really, we have three goals that we want to try to execute in the next five years. And we'll spend most of our time there. And then at the last, at the last point, we'll do a call for action. Uh, this is what we pray that the church will be on board with and what you could do to do your part given this goal. So that's where we're headed. So the first point, we're just going to review, once again, our New Life Mission Church vision and mission. And as I send the message today, this is our vision. This is what we're about. That New Life Mission Church seeks to renew lives in Orange County and beyond by teaching, living out, and living out the historic truths of the gospel. And what we're essentially about is people, as I said. People who are hurting, people who are struggling, people who are seeking a deeper sense and purpose and satisfaction in life, both for Christians and non-Christians. And our goal and our focus is gonna be on people. And in contrast to some other church visions, which are also great, but they're focused on renewing the city, renewing culture, but that's not us. We're focusing on people specifically. So all our thoughts and prayers are towards people. So we're not trying to create, as an example, these sort of gospel ecosystems to transform or renew culture or cities. We want to impact the culture and city, but renew people with the gospel of Jesus. And part of what undergirds and really moves our vision and heart, and we pray that you'd be on board with this too, is that we're just basically looking at the Bible and we're looking at, okay, what kind of church do we want to be? And as I get more and more involved in the lives of the people here and the elders do, there's just a lot of hurt. There's a lot of idols, there's a lot of sin, a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, a lot of brokenness in relationships and marriage. And one thing that's clear is that the struggles that people have in this church reflect back to me, my struggle and my idols and my needs for approval, validation, arguments, sin, broken relationships, disease in the world. And not only does it reflect my sin, but it also reflects the sin and the struggles of the world. That's why in some sense, both Christian and non-Christian, we have the same need. And that need is really the gospel of Jesus. So I want to minister the gospel to the community here, and I want us to share the gospel with the community out there. And that's how I envision the church. It's not about cities per se or culture. We think about that, but it's about people. And the more and more I'm getting convicted of this because of all the hurt and all the needs that I see in my life, in your lives, and out there in the world. So that's what moves our vision here to renew lives in Orange County and beyond with historic truths of the gospel. Historic basically means our Westminster standards, even the Heidelberg Catechism, Three Forms of Unity, for those of you who are aware of that, and also the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. We believe in history. We believe this is not a contemporary thing. It's not a faith that we made up, but in the long history and trajectory. So that's what our vision is. That's what our heart. That's who we're trying to reach. And 
the question then comes in, how do we actually accomplish this vision, this goal of renewing lives? Well, we do this through a three-point mission statement. We won't go into detail, but we essentially think we can renew lives in the church and get people out there to be renewed in the gospel through one, worship, which is today's message. Secondly, through gospel-centered community. And then third, through evangelistic outreach and missions. That's how we're going to do it. That's what we're about. Everything will flow. All our decisions, money, efforts will always flow through these three categories. So we're not about politics. You know, we're not about making money. You know, it's really trying to renew lives through these three points. So quickly, we consider here at New Life, as I said in the sermon this morning, that worship, a biblically informed Sunday service, together corporately, is our primary way to renew people. So when we think about community and outreach, we're always thinking, how can we bring these people into Sunday service to become a member and to be under the means of grace? So that always holds a pride of place. So small groups are important, but not our number one ministry. Discipleship groups are essential, but not our number one ministry to renew lives. It's gonna be through corporate worship on Sundays because we think that's what the Bible says and that's what our Westminster standards say and that's why we believe in historic Christian truths. We also believe in community, so we have community groups and discipleship groups, we have organic groups that happen. We want a community here to be vulnerable and open and honest. We want people to be able to find their place here at this church. We know that is very different, we know it's hard, but we're making small efforts in order to cultivate gospel community. So we're intentional, we put our money there, we put our training, we put our efforts there. Also, we want to be a people, especially in the years to come, that are focused outwardly upon renewing lives that are not believers, that don't know Jesus. That comes both in worldwide missions, which we have a lot of plans and thoughts for that, but also local evangelism and mercy. So the third point in outreach, which I'll elaborate later, is something that really we're trying to push for in the next five years. That's the vision statement to renew people, particularly the C, that conviction to be a biblical church is something that moves us very strongly, that we've been praying about, burdens our heart a little bit more. So how do we accomplish our vision of renewing lives? Three point mission statement, that's the idea of logic. So let's do a quick update on our 2015 goals. And most people probably don't remember them and that's okay. That's our job to remember them and remind you guys. So if you don't know them, that's our fault. So first, if you remember, we wanted to foster a culture of discipleship. This happens primarily through our curriculum and discipleship groups. It's a five-year vision. 2015 was our second year in this five-year vision. Our goal basically is to get every member through this curriculum. You don't have to lead one, but you want everyone to go through this curriculum so that at the end of the day, there's a culture of discipleship where people would minister to people and that we would come through this curriculum and see how the gospel can impact every aspect of your life. Friendships, work, evangelism, piety, money. Everything that we think of life can be impacted by the gospel. We want to create that culture here, that we love one another and invest in one another. So 2016 is going to be our third year. 2015 was our second year. The collective sense is that that little, so that little circle over there just gives a qualitative sense of how well we thought we did. So, you know, I think it's going to take time. We did it for two out of five years. Uh, it's going to be a five-year vision at least, but we feel like we're starting to get some traction. We're multiplying groups. There's been a lot of testimonies of how much of a blessing discipleship groups have. So we're sort of uh, you know, moving along, and so the Lord has been gracious in moving us there. So that's our first goal for 2015. Second was actually to begin more intentionally and programmatically to cultivate community groups um, and community. So again, that circle over there is a sense overall, qualitative, subjective, that you know, we move along, we're moving forward. Uh, we actually started community groups that are different from past ministries in the past. And generally, I thought it went really well. Never perfect, so we're always going to improve. But in terms of participation, the vision, um, not perfect. Some things kind of went to the wayside. But given all things, we wanted intentionally for people who've been at the church to be able to have their lives connect. And newcomers who are invited to our church in order to find their place here. Not perfect for sure, but there's also been a lot of good uh, testimony by the leaders and members of the church. So we're going to press forward and continue to bolster the community groups. Um, in the years to come, but for the past year, I think we did okay. I think we did fine. It was our first year trying to do this in contrast uh, to 2014. So moving along, established multimedia ministry and leader. Uh, the goals were actually small, if you recognize this. Under these goals here, we had subset goals when I presented it that are low-hanging fruit. Uh, so one of the things here for multimedia is like, one, identify a gifted person to lead this ministry. And they essentially had two things. One, let's, re, let's try to improve our Sunday service, both visually and audio. 
and then secondly, get a, a website out. Uh, so the multimedia street team has been led by Dong. They have invested a lot of work and a lot of time. They actually did really well, if people don't recognize that or not. Prioritize Sunday service first, so they did a lot of improvements in technology and visuals and sound. Um, and then they are, have been working tirelessly on the website. It didn't get launched in 2015. Um, if it did, maybe we could have filled up that last empty <laughs> spot there. But they're going to launch it soon. But it's a lot of work that's going on with the multimedia. Where they actually expanded is that they have a holistic vision. So they went into social media. They want to give a sense and clarity of who we are and where our mission and vision is about. So I think they did a really good job. And so they're extending our online presence, um, our multimedia, social media presence, even in an evangelistic way. So I think they do, they're doing a good job. Um, they did, in some ways, given our goals, um, did the best to, to put it that way. So moving along, last but not least, Develop presence in local community via Max and Mercy. Um, you just put my face there. <laughs> That's it. We had Love Fullerton. I don't think, honestly, we just got to be honest. Like, when we didn't do well, we didn't do well. So that's my fault. I take responsibility. Didn't do well vision casting this. Didn't do well. Maybe I couldn't get the leaders on board, both lay leaders and officers. Uh, so that's something I didn't do well. And But we still want to move forward and be a witness to our communities through Max and Mercy. But let's just uh, acknowledge what it is. You know, We're not good at that as a church, but we want to improve. And so maybe Love Fullerton is or is not that medium to do this, but we're going to pray, we're going to think about it. But I was encouraged by the people who participated in this yearly event. Um, we wanted more participation and use that as a launching pad to do something more regularly. Um, it didn't happen. That's my fault. I dropped the ball. And we'll see if I can pick it up again. And so we'll see how we can flesh this out in the years to come. But that's where our goal is for 2015. Any questions about this before we move on? That's sort of a general assessment. The thing I want you to take away with uh, all the details is that we are trying to be intentional in light of our vision and mission, and we recognize that God has blessed us and moved us, but we also recognize that nothing is perfect. And so be encouraged by this. This is all possible. This is a good guy and the Lord working in the heart of the church. So I'm encouraged by that. I'm encouraged by you, uh, but we'll press on by his grace and move forward. Questions before we move on from this review? Okay, let's move on quickly. All right, doing okay on time. Okay. Three to five year strategy and goals. So this is gonna be a little bit maybe heady. Uh, it's okay if you don't follow it. It's okay if I don't do a good job explaining it. I'll send this out. You can always talk to us later. But at least to you know, get your feet wet, this is where we're headed. A three to five year strategic plan. Uh, I made this, I spearheaded this, but I wanted to do this as a team effort. So primarily through the elders. So we had a one day retreat to kind of assess and evaluate where do we see the Lord leading us down the road three to five years down, specifically what will that look like. And so that's what we're going to do. <coughs> this is sort of just a conceptual picture in terms of explaining why do we even have a five year vision document. One of the things is that it helps us to take a bird, bird's eye view, to take a step back and say this is the Bible, it talks about church, and this is what our church is now. So we want to have a holistic approach, a comprehensive, honest approach about our church, positives of the church, areas of maturity that we need in the church so that nothing falls through, and then we can sort of assess how biblical and faithful we are as a church. So that's kind of an, an abstract approach to why we're doing this. So if you look under mission area, we're going to take each one of our mission statement areas and then do a qualitative general assessment. So this is what we're doing now. How can we improve this in order to reach our vision of renewing lives? So for example... Worship, this is what we currently have in a big picture. Sunday service, we're talking about Sunday, there's Bible study, um, welcoming ministry, things like that. So the question is, how can we continue to improve this, which we already have? Multimedia was a big step in that, I think. Praise team is gonna be a big step in this. Uh, presiding will be a big step to make that smoother. Now all these things we do because we want to focus our energies on worship, to renew lives in people. So the question is, as we do this five-year strategic plan, are there areas that we can improve in worship that we don't necessarily have it now. So there, there's a couple of things that uh, we want to continue to move on. So that second box is like, okay, we want to continue to improve the effectiveness of, of worship. Uh, so we want to move forward with multimedia, with sound, and then you know, Dong and Horatio have been instrumental in that. Um, it's not detailed here, but they have a lot of thoughts, a lot of intentionality. On, our, on my side, we always want to streamline more clearly uh, praise songs, the themes of sermons, um, presiding, make it as smooth as we can because this is our primary way to renew lives. So in this three to five year document, it helps us to see how can we improve worship. You'll notice there that it says we're going to start developing a college ministry, which we'll elaborate later. But I think even in worship, adding different demographics and different life stages, 
adds to the beauty of worship and enhances our experience there. So we're going to try to focus on these as just an example of what we're, do what we're doing with a five-year document. The second area is community. So we have welcoming, we have visitations by the elders, we have retreats, we have uh, welcoming dinners. So this is what we currently have in place. We're going to keep pushing, pushing on. Uh, we're going to keep investing in these ministries that we have right now. But when we're thinking in a five-year document, how can we improve the ministry and community? It's going to be what we've already been doing. We want to push forward to discipleship groups. We want to continue to improve community groups. So you're thinking automatically, as a lay member, how can I support the vision and mission? Champion the vision of community groups and discipleship groups. Prioritize it, understand the vision of these ministries, participate, get people on, and invest and be part of it. But we have Sunday service, we have welcoming, that's what we do now. We've already started discipleship community groups, but it takes a multi-year vision. So we're gonna continue to invest in discipleship and community groups to extend uh, our ministry to help us to be more fruitful, effective, and more faithful. And last but not least, outreach. Generally, it's mission support. Um, I think we're stronger in mission support in terms of global overseas missions for our missionaries. There's definitely a lot of um, improvements we can make there while also acknowledging all the hard work that people have. But when we're thinking about outreach in general, this is a big area that we need to improve on, I think. So part of the things that we're thinking about to renew lives in a missional perspective is going to be through church planning, local evangelism, and maybe continuing to partner with nonprofit organizations to meet some of the needs of our neighbors and our city in Fullerton and beyond. So church planning, local evangelism, and also to partner with nonprofit organizations that we had uh, in the past, and to be more intentional about this. And there's some members that the church feel really passionately about mercy ministry, so we'll try to work with them, empower them, and really do this as a light and a beacon for the world. So that's how we're going to improve our mission support improvements on current missions committee, but also to extend this and think more strategically, intentionally in church planning, evangelism, and partnering with nonprofit organizations for acts of mercy. So this is the point of a three to five year vision document to improve our faithfulness and effectiveness. Um, it helps us to identify what's most important, align our vision and mission, and then move forward from there. So again, to elaborate on this so that you guys understand um, as clearly as we can why we have this document, this is what we just did first, so it ensures a big picture, macro perspective on our church, so that we can focus on areas of need, areas of immaturity, and should continue to grow from there. Um, the second reason that we want to do a five-year document is to make sure that we're intentional of aligning all our money and efforts with our vision and mission. So we want to be strategic, and so part of being strategic means that we have our identity. For better or worse, you may not like our identity, but that's who we are. This is our vision, this is our goal, and this is how we're going to do it. This is our culture. Uh, we're not going to be a Saddleback, we're not going to be a Mariners, you know, we're not going to be a Pacific Crossroads Redeemer in New York, we're going to be New Life Fullerton, we're a Reformed Church, we're going to embrace our identity, I think we have a niche in what we can do to really minister to people, I use this analogy, say we're sort of like Nokia when they're in cell phone business, they just said let's not try to be AT&T and Verizon, we're going to be Nokia, we're going to have a competitive advantage and really strategically invest in a particular demographic. Um, Nokia went out of business, <laughs> so, but we had to go the horse great, so we don't have kind of business. <laughs> but we want to be strategic in aligning our efforts, money, uh, time a lot in our leaders for our vision and mission. This also prioritizes the needs in our church, and this is an important one. Maybe the most important one out of this binder document. This, is, this document will help explain why we put money towards certain ministries, why the leadership invests our time and energy here, and most importantly, why we will, as gently as we can, say no to your ideas for ministry. Not all the time. We invite thoughts, improvements, we invite other ideas, but this is going to be the guiding light and beacon to direct our resources to this vision and mission, but also say no to other people, uh, in our, even within leadership, and maybe the leaders to say no to me, because it says it's not aligned with our vision and mission. It doesn't prioritize what we're trying to do. It's not derail where we think the Lord is going. But there's a billion different ministries and requests and felt needs among the church. That's why we just kind of say no. I, as an example, so some people wanted to bring back men's and women's ministries, and I said, no, we don't have time for that. Um, we don't, it's not necessarily something that we prioritize. We have community groups, we have welcoming groups, we have discipleship groups, we have Sunday. Some people thought bringing back growth groups, all these are great ideas. But limited resources means we have to prioritize. So I said, we have discipleship groups and community groups. We're not going to bring back growth groups. When I first came here in 2011, we had an average attendance of about 80. 
and we had about four or five ministries that are all for community. Uh, we had district groups, we had men's and women's groups, we had growth groups, midweek Bible studies. It was just, it's, that's an example of very faithful and fruitful ministry, but not necessarily strategic. We have four ministries for the same goal. We can't reach and micromanage every felt need in the church or even every felt need in the pastor or elder. So this helps us to be disciplined and prioritize our efforts. While we say yes to certain things, we'll recruit people to certain things, but say no to other things. So it's not because you have a bad idea, and don't be discouraged, but if you come up with something that we don't necessarily agree with, it's not because it's a bad idea, but it's not a line where we think the Lord is leading us. And so I think this document helps us. It is going to be our strategic Bible that we're going to direct our efforts and our thoughts. Last but not least, it'll help us to track our goals like we did. Not that clearly, but at least in some sense to say we have practical goals, can we keep track of our progress? So I think this, these are the reasons why we will try to, as the best of our ability, um, utilize this document, this strategic initiative, and move forward to there. Questions about why we had the five-year document? So I don't expect everyone to remember this, but we'll move forward. So FYI, this is not the five-year document. This is a separate document, much more detailed, many more words. I just give it, technically anyone can read it. It's just saying this is what our action steps are. But right now, I've given it to the elders, deacons, and some of the committee leaders. So this isn't the five-year document. This is a presentation to you to let you know what we're going to do. But the five-year document has a lot of bullet points, a lot of words, and this is sort of like available to anyone, really, but what we're going to give to leaders, this is what I'm going to follow in the next three or five years. That's my plan. I'm going to take this document. I'm going to try to follow these steps. We prayed about it. We thought about it. We're trying to champion it, and that's where we're headed. So questions about that? OK, if not, last but not least, um, this is not set in stone. God will have different plans. We're going to maybe mess up. We may fail. So everything's in pencil. You know, so we're going to use this to guide our resources and prioritize, but everything's in pencil. You know, maybe our goals won't work out because God has different plans. That's okay. You know, even if I want to use the word fail, which isn't the right word, I don't mind saying I failed. That, that's okay. It's in pencil what we're planning. So we always want to be dependent upon the Lord. It's not in pen. It's in pencil. So there's always changes to change timeline priorities, even goals. So don't think that this is set in stone. We want to be people of faith, not by sight, and we want to depend upon the Lord to move forward. Questions, thoughts? Okay. Okay, three goals, overview. This is what we're planning to do while maintaining our current ministries, our community group, discipleship group, and Sunday service. Okay, the first is that we want to renew lives in Orange County and beyond, and I think the Bible tells us confessionally that the most effective way to evangelize is going to be through the local church. So we are going to start a campaign in addition to church plan. I think the leaders are excited about this. We know there's a lot of baggage with this at our church in history, but we want to be intentional, we want to be transparent, we want to be thoughtful, and let you know that from day one today, our leadership, including myself, we're going to cast a vision, and we're going to try to press forward with a church plan. That's what we're going to do. You're probably wondering, how are we going to do this? Who's going to go? I don't know. I don't know. I just know I'm not going. So, <laughs> I'm going to champion this for other people to go. <laughs> so we'll go from there. But there's much more detail in terms of how we how we'll do this. Uh, so we're going to church plant. Um, that goes into our, our mission statement, outreach. That's the general time in pencil, 2019. In other words, we want to give birth to a church plan in four years. That's our plan. But we'll flesh this out as we move along. Secondly, I think we need to cultivate a vision for evangelism. Um, so I, I coined this a 2020 outreach vision. Basically, 2020 vision, we're clear, we're focused, we know who we are, we know who we're trying to reach. Very simple, 20 confessions of faith about the year 2020. Some people say, why, why, why is it 20, like four a year in the next five years? That seems kind of low. Um, well, one, I needed 20 because it sounds good with 2020. So, <laughs> to be honest about that, but this is my thought, which I'll elaborate again, is that we're not good at evangelism. Let's just be honest, we're not good. We're good at theology, we're good at doctrine, we're good at worship, we're not good at evangelism. So we're not gonna be a sleek sort of saddlebag or these other more secret sensitive churches that are really good at this. The analogy I keep using is that these other churches are like riding a 10-speed bike on the Tour de France. They're sleek, they're fast, they're efficient. I'm trying to get us on the tricycle. <laughs> just get on the tricycle. You don't even have to pedal. Just get on the tricycle, see what it feels like. We're not Christians up here. Let's feel like, what does that feel like? Talk to somebody, I go to church. That's what we're saying. We're not gonna have a streamlined vision. We're gonna get 2020, we're gonna be clear and focused. It's gonna take years to create this. Uh, there's a lot of reasons that people give, and I understand it's fearful. Business relationships can be uh, damaged. 
we're very Korean, we're very mono-ethnic, and I talk to these church planners, they say, don't let any of those stand in your way. You can't stand before the God, the, God, the judge of all, the, all things, and says, evangelism, one of the main things in the Bible, why didn't you evangelize? There's too much kimchi in there. <laughs> I, don't, I can't invite non Koreans. It just doesn't, they may not come here, but it doesn't mean we can't put forth our best effort in evangelizing. I have a heartbreak for any types of people, socio-demographically, ethnically, whatever it may be, culturally. So 2020 vision, 20 confessions of <laughs> faith. I have a plan <laughs> that I pray that you guys will be on board to reach people, new people in Orange County and beyond. The third one will be college ministry. We'll explain this as we get there. People are asking me, why in the world are we doing college? If you're in college here, don't feel bad about that. <laughs> we love college. Uh, there's a reason why as we thought about our vision and mission, why we're going to focus on college ministry. Uh, Dave Pack will lead that and Spear have that effort. But we want to turn new lives for all demographics. And one of the things that we want to do is to look at our church and say, well, our church is getting older. I really believe in our ministry here. I'm going to champion it. I'm going to embrace it. I think we have something very biblical, um, sitting in for reform, maybe. <laughs> something very biblical. And I believe in what we're doing. And so I want to share this and raise the next generation of leaders. There's youth group, there's CM. Children are always going to be important. But we want to raise the next generation of leaders. And there's reasons that we could do this as to why we're going to do this. And I'll explain when we get to that point. So those are our three goals for the next three to five years. It's in pencil, but we're excited. We pray that you'll be excited as well. And this is where the church is hopefully being led by God. Questions about this first. I'm going to go through each one very briefly and give you a sense of what our plan is so we can have some application. But these are our three goals for the next year. You'll notice that most of them are geared towards outreach. That's because we spent the last 22 years on inreach. So we could do local outreach and global missions has always been the heart in the beginning of this church. So we want to maintain that culture. This church started with a missions heart. We want to cultivate and keep that missions heart. But we want to grow and mature the missions heart, not only overseas, but also locally. Church planning, evangelism, college ministry. Those are our three goals. Questions, thoughts? Okay, so more specifically, church planning. Okay, what are we trying to do here? We want to plant a reformed church with its own distinct culture and strengths to reach a specific demographic or area. And why are we doing this? Why are we church planning? Because we have the answer to the hurt of people. We have the answer to the eternal lives of people. What drives all of this is going to be the vision statement of renewing life in Orange County and beyond. That's what drives us. We're not trying to brand ourselves. We're not trying to grow bigger in number. We want the kingdom to grow by reaching people who are lost and hurt don't know Jesus Christ. And the most effective way to do this is going to be through a local church plan. It's in our DNA, whether you realize it or not, we've church planted many times. Maybe we haven't done it as well as we should have. That's why we're trying to do it this way, transparency, intentionality. It's the most effective way to evangelize, but it also allows members such as yourself, if you want to be involved in a church plan and impact the community in a different way that Fullerton can, this is your opportunity. If you want to meet the needs of people in a way that Fullerton can, this is your opportunity. If you want to take on a different culture of a church because you think that could be strategic, this is your opportunity. And what I'm saying is this when it comes to church planning. We're never going to feel ready to church plan with another church. The analogy that I take from somebody that I talk to is the first parent. No matter how many books you read about parenting, when you have your first kid, you're never ready. We're never going to feel ready. If we wait till we feel ready at the mother church, we're never going to church plan. And no parent is ever ready, but what do they do? They keep having more children. There's something beautiful about that. Usually, people who have children have more children. So churches that church plant will have church plant more. They have a higher probability. And so there's thinking and rationale as to why we do this. A church plant can reach a different community and people that Fullerton can. Not because we're bad or deficient, but local churches take different personalities and strengths based on their vision, based on their, the pastor that leads them and the elders and the leadership. They could be a different church holding on to reform doctrine, but different in culture and advantages than we can. You can give birth and form a culture when you give birth to a new baby in a church. What we have at Fullerton is a young adult, we're 23 years old. We're a millennial. We're entitled. <laughs> we think we know it all. We're a millennial. Now we think we're all that in culture. That doesn't mean like Fullerton. Maybe that's reflective of Elder Alex. <laughs> 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 I'm going to say me, but I don't want to keep throwing myself under the bus. <laughs> I mean, he may be the older member, but you know, he's uh, wise in all his ways. Um, but that's, that's the idea. Local church, even if it's planted two miles from here, can take on a very different culture and strategic advantage to reach a different people than we can. 
and we want to renew lives. So we want to plant a church, and this is why we're going to do it. So what does this look like? This is just four things that we thought about. You don't have to memorize it. I'm just going to go through it quickly. We call this our action plan, but these are four critical success factors. In other words, with the goal of church planting, what four things do we need in order to make a church plant happen? This is what we think. So we need to find a church planner. That we need to have a strategic plan for the next four years. We need to determine a budget, and we need to teach and prepare our church here. This is what we're investing our efforts in the years to come. So we want to hire somebody else as an example. This is a classic example of why we need a five-year plan. We need a lot of help. I need some help at this church. I need a counseling pastor. I can use a worship pastor. I need an executive administration pastor. Because of our strategic initiative to church plant, all those three functions are going to take a back seat. Why? Because I'm going to look for the guy who has a heart gift and is to plant a church. He may be a good worship leader. He may be good administratively. He may be a good counselor. All those are second to me because I'll work through it. I'll suffer through it with the elders. But I'm going to find a church planner. Somebody who could lead, has a vision, conviction, work with us. That's how this plan directs our efforts and thoughts. So if you know anybody who wants to church plant, who's reformed, has a conviction, could work with us, you know, let me know. If you're saying, I know a great counselor, if your dad doesn't want a church plan, direct him somewhere else. Because <laughs> this is how it directs us. So we're going to develop a strategic plan. There's, there's a way to do this. Um, we're going to try it. And we're going to determine a budget plan. So even for this first year, this is what we want the people to be on board with. We're going to put our money where our mouths are. So we're going to put, I think, 10% uh, of our missions budget as seed money. And then we're going to put that, at least starting this first year, we're going to start praying about it. Pray for a church planner, pray for our hearts to reach new people, new lives through a church plan. But we're going to put our money where our mouth is, and then we're going to put 10% of our missions budget towards it starting this year. That's what we want to do in preparation. With church planning, friends, we'll never plan everything out. So the analogy that I've heard and I like is that when it comes to church planning, we got to walk across the bridge as we're building it. We can't <coughs> finalize every detail and know exactly how this is going to work out. We don't know. We'll never feel ready. As a parent, we'll never feel ready. And we can't plan everything out. We're doing the best that we can to be intentional, transparent, strategic, but we're going to walk across the bridge as we're building it. We're going to walk by faith and not by sight. That's what it's going to take at the church plan. It's going to be messy for sure. Uh, but a couple of things, we want to be transparent again, intentional. We're going to put our money where our mouth is, and I'm not going to be that church planning guy. I'm going to try to stay here at the mother church, and I'm going to send somebody else to go do the hard work. I like our cafe in the building. <laughs> I like my office. I love comfort. I don't want to deal with renting a building and transporting speakers every Sunday. I don't want to do that. I've done that before. <laughs> but I'm going to pray for some of you to do that. And that's our planning. So that's church planning. Much more detailed, again, in the five-year document. This is just a brief overview. We'll take questions at the end. Okay, 2020 Vision Outreach. So we want to create a culture of evangelism, and as I said, we want 20 confessions of faith by 2020. How do we define confessions of faith? So you guys know, this is how we're counting it, we're thinking about it. We're going to take confessions of faith for non-Christians, that's just straight evangelism from no one who even knew Jesus, baptize them, get them into the church, that's what we want. We're also going to take this from nominal Christians. Nominal Christians just say they're Christian, but they're really not Christian. And so that's more sensitive. So the elders will take care of that in terms of shepherding them and then interviewing them. They may think they're Christian because they go to church, but they're really not Christian. So we want to be intentional in reaching these people and meeting their needs. We also want to reach people who we call de-churched. De-churched basically means somebody who grew up in the church, fell away for many years, and then recently came back to church. So they're familiar with Christian culture and church, but they didn't necessarily live a faithful life, a godly life, and so they came back. So we don't know if they're believers or not, but it's hard to say that they're actually believers, but we want to welcome them, embrace them into our community, and love them, but recognize that they may not be a believer, so we want to intentionally reach out and think about them. Uh, we have, in some ways, maybe all three of these people at our church today. And so we want to be thoughtful about this, but we want to grow evangelistically. So why are we doing this? Very simple. One of the things I do when I read the Bible, or prepare a message for Bible study, is recognize how important evangelism is in the Bible. The book of Jonah, the book of First Timothy, the book of Acts. And so when I read this, I feel uncomfortable, because it's an area in my life that I'm immature at. And I look at the church, and I feel like we're in uncomfortable. I feel uncomfortable about it, because our church isn't good at it. Missions, yes. Local missions, no, not so much. And so I want to be a reformed biblical church. How can we be effective, as the first slide shows us, to evangelism. And this is where I think we have to go with local evangelism. 
So we want to reach 20 confessions by 2020, and by the Lord's grace, maybe we'll reach 200 by 2020, whatever it may be. But this is why we want to do this. It's in our vision statement. We want to renew lives in Orange County and beyond, in these walls and out. I know many of you have non-Christian friends, and that's fantastic. Love them and embrace them, and invite them out to church. Share the gospel with them. Understand this is what we're praying for you to do. We want you to be part of this vision and this movement to mature our church biblically. So that's what we're doing. So what are we going to do? Critical success factors. Um, sort of subjective, uh, sort of uh, esoteric, abstract, but it's much more concrete if you read the other five-year document. One, things that, one thing I'm trying to do is get the leaders on board. That is, we got to do this with the elders, the deacons, their families, and even lay leaders. Um, so part of what this looks like is that when I meet with the EM elders, we're going to try to pray for non-Christian people that we know. We're going to hold each other accountable and say, okay, this past month, is there anybody that you talked to? How are you doing with the person that you're praying for? We want to model what we want to see in the church. We're going to try to invite people to our church so that you guys can see what the kingdom can do and the gospel can do. But I think the leaders need to lead by example, so we're going to do this with the elders and deacons. So when they talk to me, how can I serve the church? And they have their own idea. I may shoot that idea down and say, this is where effectively as a church we're moving forward. Think about having something to invite people over. Think about how you can evangelize to the non-Christian, how you can love people. Think about this along your own lines. Secondly, we're going to concretely encourage members. That sounds kind of plain, but we have very practical ways that we're going to do this. And third, we're going to educate, the elders will educate the congregation in Bible studies, training, and we want to train you guys to be able to do this. So this is our second goal for the next three or five years, 2020 vision. Okay, last but not least, college ministry. I'm going to explain this uh, in terms of why, and then David Pack's going to explain to, uh, in terms of his strategic plan or strategic plan how to do this. One of the questions that people have been getting is like, why college? It seems so like random. Uh, you know, why are all of a sudden we're about college students and why are we doing this? But again, it goes back to our vision statement that I believe in so much, I believe so much in what we're doing here that we want to reach a different generation. Our church is maturing and we're getting older, but I believe in what we're doing here and we want to raise the next generation of leaders. CM and youth group could always is a high priority. We want to think about it and pray about it, but there are already some ministries in place to reach those demographics, but we want to reach college. And that is consistent with what we want to do in our vision statement to renew lives, particularly with a different demographic. But why we want to do this, in addition, is that it's one of our core values, if you know this, that we want to be intergenerational. You know, that's why there's a camp first generation, we're, we're Korean American second generation, we care about our children, but this is also something that we want to be intergenerational with. And there's a couple of reasons that we want to do this in addition to that. One, theologically, it's beautiful to have different demographics in our church. So I think a collegiate group will bring a different aspect of life, a different energy. And in the, in the spirit of Ephesians 4, where it says the church has a manifold wisdom, a different phase of beauty in the church, college and younger demographic will be that different aspect in beauty theologically to our church and our worship. <coughs> I believe in that, even though it's doctrinal and theological. But secondly, I think there's practical benefits there as well, is that we can raise the next generation of leaders. And in my thought and my thinking is that it could help us they can serve in ways that family members can't because they're college, because they have um, a particular stage where they're not hindered in certain ways that parents and maybe other uh, young adults have. So for example, they can maybe more consistently teach and staff our CM in our youth group. Uh, they can actually serve in other capacities and ministries and committees that is a little bit difficult for parents. And so I think theologically, it adds life and a different beauty to our worship and our body, but practically, they could staff our education and they could serve in committees in a ways that we can. The main driving force, though, is that the collegiate, I think, just need help. A lot of them don't go to church, they just in parachurch ministries. We want to work with the parachurch ministry, but to get them into the local church and then train them, encourage them, feed them in reform ministry and theology. That is what we want to do in terms of renewing their lives. So we're going to put our efforts towards that, and we want to uh, pray about it. We have a plan for this. And with that said, I'm going to hand this over to David, and he will go through just the critical success factors of college. Thank you. Uh, so how do we successfully create a college ministry? Uh, well, here are the three uh, action plans that we need to really fulfill to make this happen. Uh, develop a four-year curriculum 
And hopefully that's something we can uh, begin in 2016. I'm not quite sure if we can really, really make it uh, perfect by this year, but we really want to um, at least have a full curriculum. Establish college student leadership and establish a Friday night college ministry. And um, as I explain and give you a, a fuller description of these three action plans, uh, I hope you kind of understand our reasoning and why we identify these three things as key factors for a college ministry. Um, develop a four-year curriculum. Uh, you know, I believe um, this is consistent with our identity as a church, as a church which is word-centered. We put a very high priority on God's word as the truth. And um, so I believe this is consistent. Um, I believe what makes us beautiful as a church, as a reformed church, is our doctrine. That we have this very robust and vibrant doctrine that we teach and preach. And so this is why developing a four-year curriculum is so important. And I believe in line with who we are. I want um, students who come into our church uh, four or five years in, during college that they would be able to graduate college um, and have a very mature and, theologic, and be very theologically competent Christians, uh, people who are equipped with God's truth. Um, and you know, this also falls back in line, connects with our vision of outreach. We want people at our church to be equipped with God's truth, to be able to articulate and defend their Christian faith very well. So uh, that's part of it. Um, and this will comprise of like Friday nights, uh, which we're currently doing, but in the future as the college ministry develops to have a um, Bible study on a college campus. Uh, student leadership. Uh, this is kind of um, several reasons why. Uh, one, because it's biblical to develop and uh, God's people to equip them for servanthood. Um, but also there's a practical reason. Uh, we believe that students, in order to become vital members of the church, must take ownership of the church. Um, and so that's the second reason uh, for students to take ownership and serve and lead the ministry itself. Um, so that will take some time as well, but to kind of begin that in 2016. And then uh, thirdly, to establish a Friday night college ministry. You know, I spoke with a lot of uh, experienced and wise pastors uh, in college ministry, and it's unanimously consensus among them that for college students, uh, for their stage in life, Friday night is actually a very, very big deal. Um, that one key success factor for having a vibrant college ministry is having a very fully developed Friday night event. Uh, but in order to have a good Friday night college ministry, right, um, the wisdom that we've collected from other people is you need to have community. For, co for college students in their life stage, community is very, very important as they are uh, maturing into adulthood. Um, their community and their peers very much defines their identity. Well, in order to have community, right, you need to have strong campus presence. Right now we have no campus presence. And having a campus, trying to establish a campus presence without having community is, it seems on a very practical level, close to impossible. And so instead of trying to start something new and do it on our own with our limited resources, with our limited, almost non-existent experience, uh, we decided that it'd be better to partner with an existing uh, college uh, campus ministry. And so, uh, beginning in 2016, uh, not only will you know, my job here, right, as the college director, but I'm also going to become KCM staff, uh, particularly at KCM UCI uh, in Irvine. Uh, let me just explain why. Um, I kind of did, but why we're doing, why we are partnering with uh, KCM. I know some of you may have reservations of us partnering with 
a parachurch ministry because it's not the church. And uh, you're right, KCM is not a church. It's a parachurch ministry. Para from the Greek meaning beside the church. And the, the focus of our college ministry will always be primarily the church. The church is God's plan A. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't use other ministries. Uh, you know, uh, parachurch ministry is not bad or evil. It's just we need to understand its role and its place uh, as supplemental. And our church is already involved in many parachurch ministries. For example, New Life Mission Association is a parachurch ministry. Right? New Life Association. Westminster Seminary is a parachurch ministry. Ministry. And so these are examples of how parachurch ministry is good and how it's, God uses parachurch ministries for his kingdom purposes. Um, and KCM, I believe, is also uh, a very good ministry. Um, speaking about KCM, I will become part of the, the staff, KCM staff at UCI. And right now we're still finalizing that, so it's not... It's not final yet. It's in the process of being finalized. And what that looks like, it's still uncertain as we dialogue uh, about what that looks like and what that would entail. But rest assured, uh, church is primary. Uh, KCM will not compete uh, with New Life um, when it comes to my time, availability, and resources. Uh, I've been. Uh, I and Pastor Will have been speaking very closely with the KCM uh, leadership, upper leadership, particularly with Richard Kim, who's the director of KCM and pastor, senior pastor at um, GLMC. And, um, you know, when we speak with him, we're very comforted by the direction and his leadership in KCM. It seems like we're very much on, on the same page. And the things that he envisions with KCM um, I think it's very in line with what we are trying to do as New Life Mission Church. Um, KCM, under his leadership, has made great improvements. Uh, for example, every general meeting, every week when KCM meets, uh, the KCM president always announces that KCM is not a church. And they always encourage students to attend and become members of a church. Every week that announcement is made, and they list up on the screen all the churches that are partnering with KCM. Right? Um, every KCM campus is now, the, the, the hope is that every uh, KCM campus is partnered up with three local churches so that KCM is very stable and church centered. Right? So I would become one of three uh, pastors, church pastors, uh, working at KCM. Um, this will provide um, just that, that partnership it would just be stronger. Um, also, um, it's not just you know, it's, it's not you know, KCM just doesn't allow anyone to join its leadership and KCM staff. They are first vetted through Pastor Richard, right? And Pastor Richard's desire is to bring in pastors and churches that are Christ and gospel centered. So yes, there are like Baptists and perhaps even non-denominational churches partnering with KCM. But these churches and their preaching must be gospel and Christ centered. So I think that's something we can work with and partner up with. Um, and uh, so, I mean, those are some benefits that KCM receives through our partnership. But what do we receive as a church in our partnership with KCM? We have campus presence. Um, not only that, but it also fulfills many of our principles as a church, uh, namely outreach, right? Um, yeah, KCM, um, many of the people that attend KCM do not go to a local church, are not members of a local church. Either they do not go to church, or perhaps they float around at different churches. And you know what? That is a problem, but that is a good problem. Because KCM is not a church, and they're able to go out there and do the work that churches are perhaps not able to do. And that's where the church comes in. Um, with partnerships, strong partnerships with the church, 
uh, for example, us as New Life, to have a strong campus presence, we are able to reach out to those students who need a church, right? And hopefully through KCM, we are able to develop a midweek campus Bible study um, to really get our name out there as New Life and start reaching out. And so hopefully as our partnership with KCM grows, many of you who live in Irvine, you can help uh, me Right? by perhaps being host families, supporting rides, giving rides, and just creating partner, uh, relationships with students in Irvine. Um, hopefully that will lead to a strong Friday night college ministry, and student leadership, and develop a strong curriculum. So those are, in summary, all our, all our goals for the next three to five years. Um, to close this out, and we'll take a que questions, but usually people in this size group don't want to ask questions. But like, at the end of the day, you know, let's just be honest. You know, sometimes uh, this sort of presentation is too much of a, a corporate feel. Uh, maybe it seems like it's too uh, works based because it's not uh, it's not stepping in faith. It's too intentional. Uh, I just want to be a good steward. I want to be loving and intentional and wise. But under through and in all this is going to be our heart for people in the gospel. And you know, I've been sharing this from the, the pulpit, I've been sharing this with leaders, but it's a small sphere of people that I've been, the Lord has brought before me. There's just people that are hurting. You know, there's a lot of people I've met and still keep in touch with. He says he just wants to be a dad. Uh, he's an alcoholic. He's been in and out and abused. Uh, there is a guy I shared, shared about before I met on the airplane, Tom Shellman. He is ter he's terminally ill with cancer. He's a universalist. He knows Christianity, completely rejects it. I have the answer for him. Not because I'm smart, because it's been given to me. Uh, there's people, there's a guy named Ron, who's older in my neighborhood. He reads a book on the sidewalk for 12 hours a day. So every time I drive by, I wave and I talk to him once. He's a guy that the Lord has been placing on my heart to pray for. And I think these are just small examples of opportunities that all of us have. And the vision of this church to new lives is all about that. It's all about the gospel. It's all about the glory of the God, glory of God that we can reach and help people. We have that answer. We have the answer of what we, what we can give to them. Even for the church locally, one of the greatest blessings that I've personally been having is our prayer meetings because I've been getting people to share testimonies. And our church is not that vulnerable. We're not that transparent as the people. We don't confess our sins or our vulnerabilities or weaknesses nearly as much as we should. But for some reason, the Lord's been using prayer meetings to do this. And I realize the same need that people out there need is the same need that people inside the church need. We're not different from them. We are along the same lines as them. And that's why, both in the church and outside the church, I want to share the gospel and minister to them because it's about renewing their lives and moving them. And it's kind of scary, you know, I, I, to be honest, like, I don't like failing, but I feel like I'm setting myself up to fail here. I mean, why would I make more work for myself? The only reason is because I just can't be complacent here. I feel like we've got to move forward, we've got to reach people, the Bible dictates it. Otherwise, I just keep maintaining shit. You know, it's a comfortable job in some ways, and I don't just do minimal work. But I don't think that's what the gospel calls us to do. And so I want to think big. I want to be strategic. I want to have a vision for this. And the spirit of what gives me comfort is Ephesians 3.20, in which he says, that Paul says, God can do more than we ever ask or think. You may not be able to accomplish this, but the Lord can do this through us. So last but not least, what can you do for these and next steps? One of the things is that I continue to think about this and pray about this. If you're just aware of what we're doing, that would help us a lot. Even if you disagree, but you're aware, that could be good. A step further is that if you could champion this vision and goals, to be a champion for it, not a consumer, as Pastor Paul said, but champion the church and where we're trying to go. Uh, not to be so critical, but to be constructively critical, but to champion this and to be thoughtful. We also need prayer. We need prayer for specific things, such as a church planner, a heart to church plant, a heart to reach other people, and cultivate a culture within the mother church to be okay with church planting again and to changing and shifting our focus to the areas that we need to mature in. So we need a lot of prayer. We want prayer for college ministry and David Pack that we can reach a campus ministry and raise up the next generation. We want the gospel <laughs> to really hit those people and to teach them about reformed ecclesiology and piety. We want to reach them and to minister to them. And we want to pray for yourselves and your hearts to have a culture of evangelism and to have your heart love Jesus, to be intimate with Jesus and to impact the world. That you can have a heart that breaks for people who you know are breaking because they're just like you and me. And that's what we want you to pray for. Specifically, what does it mean in the area of 2020 vision? So we'll be doing an evangelism seminar February 13th in the morning. It's basically taking some of the material from this ministry called City to City 
and it's very practical, very helpful. So I've already got most of the elders and deacons on board, but we're going to send an invite out. It'll just be a couple hours on Saturday morning. We'll train you in community groups. It's not going to be lecture-based. Very practical, very helpful. As David and Andrew, Andrew may not know yet, but thanks for volunteering. He'll take care of some of the youth group students all that morning. And Director Kim will take care of the CM students. So there'll be childcare, and then I'm going to find someone to do lunch. So just be wary if I'm going to ask. We're going to have three people in mind. So there'll be food there. So we're going to lead through an evangelist seminar. It's not going to make you experts, but it'll be a way to together be on board this vision to be trained. And we just want you, and I want you to encourage you just to invite people to your community group. Um, I know it's hard, I know there's all these kind of rational explanations as to why we can't do this, but I don't think that's the way the kingdom of Jesus always works. Think about inviting someone just to have a meal at a community group or in your house. Invite someone to church because sometimes they say less intimidating environment is church. You can hide in the back, you don't have to go to community group, people all up in your face asking you what you believe. Invite them to church. If they don't like it, that's okay. You know, but they could be under the gospel. So one of the sermon series that I'll be starting on February 28th is going to be a four-week series called Questions from a Skeptic. I'm going to try to tackle four questions that I commonly hear in my small circle of friends as well as reading, four questions that non-Christians have. I think this helps us to understand our faith, but also will address some of the concerns of non-believers. So invite somebody to church. Even if we get one person to come to one of the sermons in the series, we're going to have to get on the tricycle. So that will start February 28th. So keep this on your calendars, pray about it. This is in a small way that you can continue to champion this vision. Other things that you can do is to continue to be involved in discipleship groups, if that's you, community groups, to be understanding of our worship and our philosophy and ministry. There's many ways to crystallize this in your lives. And last but not least, I think that one of the ways that you can get on board is because there are plenty of ways that you yourself can contribute and serve, and find and match for your gifts. I think it also help ensure your faith so that you can grow in your understanding of the gospel. It will also provide various ways for you to impact the community if that's your burden and you think our church is not good at that. You have an opportunity here to do all of those three things. You have an opportunity to make our church better and healthier. You have an opportunity to have eternal significance and reward by being faithful by the Lord's grace to impact the community. So I pray that you'll be with us and pray that you'll pray with us and challenge us actually. Uh, this isn't pencil, but we want your input and thoughts and heart in this. And I know it's hard, but moving along this way can help your spiritual life in profound ways. And to that end, you would renew lives with the members of this church as well. So that's it. It's late, but I'll take a couple of minutes for questions. If anybody has questions, if not, then I'm going to close in prayer. And then you can ask questions later, because that's usually how it happens. But if anyone's bold enough to ask a question from the beginning, this is your chance, otherwise our doors, elders are always open to this. Johnny. So one of the questions that Johnny said with KCM, there's a lack of oversight. Um, one of the things that KCM has actually is within their leadership. They have a doctrinal statement, I believe. They have a position that they believe in, and they're trying to flesh that out publicly. Um, the oversight for us is because they're a parachurch, is that our oversight will ultimately come from the presbytery. So we actually have a free relationship with the parachurch ministry. So that's why we vet their theology and vet their methodology. If that ever changes, then we'll just pull out. Yeah, so that's, um, we don't have oversight over them, but if they start teaching something radical or doctrinally different, or they're not putting their money where their mouth is in terms of saying they want gospel center preachers, churches are plan A, then for us, our oversight will still be the session in the presbytery, but we have that freedom with a parachurch to engage or not engage. So for us, it's more oversight of our local church here. Um, if the parachurch goes astray, then we're just going to pull out. That's going to be our plan. I mean, several years ago, we had college ministry at UCI as well. Yeah. So hopefully we have like a new life for yeah. So, was there a rationale in between picking UCI versus Cal State Fullerton? Yeah. Cal State Fullerton is more of a community. Yeah. Or a yeah. Okay. Good question. So, Injung's asking, is there a reason why we chose UCI Irvine over Cal State Fullerton and Fullerton College? Um, I think the rationale is essentially this. If we want to establish a stable college ministry, which we're saying is about 30 members, the easiest way to establish a college ministry is to have a Friday ministry. The easiest way to start a Friday ministry is to partner with the campus ministry. And so we believe that given the values and culture of KCM, that aligns mostly with our vision. 
And so we work under their system, which means the availability of working with a closer church is not there. So UCI, KCM is where it is. Fullerton College and Cal State Fullerton, we've exhausted those opportunities. We actually did talk to Danny Choi about it. Uh, we don't have any student presence. And to start a campus ministry from scratch is going to be infinitely more harder than partnering with an existing campus ministry to get the ground running. So our vision is actually to grind it out at UCI KCM. If we get traction, we establish some level of stability in college ministry, then we talk to KCM or other campus ministries that we can start reaching out to Fullerton College or Cal State Fullerton. But that will be something that will be more like a step two or three because it's much more infinitely harder to start something from scratch without student presence. And we can't even use our facilities if there's no students that are members of our church to go there. And it just reaches much tougher is what everyone's telling us. So we'll start with UCI KCN and hopefully we'll grow. Secondly, we'll go to more local church, local colleges to establish it there. Okay, last but not least, any other questions? Can I just um, add some? Uh, uh, I should maybe later, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. For a church planter, yeah. Are you talking about a pastor or a uh, Pastor, yeah. Church planter has to be a pastor, yeah. Last but not least, before I close, any loud over here. Okay, with that said, if I could kindly ask Elder Alex to close for us, if that's okay. <clears throat> Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for uh, this vision that you cast it, Lord, we believe that this is your plan and your divine inspiration to the leaders of this church. We pray, Lord, that we would be people who are mindful of your Spirit's guiding. Help us, Lord, to be open-minded to the way that you're leading. Uh, we pray for the members that they would be prayerful uh, for the leaders. We pray for the leaders that they'd be consistent and follow through in executing all that you've given to them, Lord. Uh, and we pray that you are your gospel would continue to renew our lives here at church and we would be so inspired to share the good news with so many others that we would see others coming to faith, saving faith, that your name would continue to be glorified and magnified. Thank you again, Lord, for this time. In Jesus' name.